Hello, and welcome back to CS615 System Administration. This is week 4, and after we've covered storage models and disks, as well as the boot process, partitions, and the Unix file system, we'll spend a fair chunk of the videos for this week on the topic of software, and more specifically, how to install it and how to manage it. In our last video, we already talked a bit about the file system hierarchy and a look at the here manual page, and we found out that there's a reason for why we have a certain directory structure, which tells us which software parts go where. This will be something we will get back to when we talk about package management and software installation in particular. In its most general definition, software is just another term for a program telling a computer to perform a certain task. Practically, however, there are a number of different types of software, and we've already seen some of them as part of our discussion of booting a system. In this video, we will attempt to categorize these types, even though the distinctions or differentiating factors are far from clear-cut, as you will quickly notice. We've already identified a specific component that happens to be implemented in software, the file system. Instinctively, we categorize the file system as being in a lower layer than certain applications, such as the web server, for example. But the file system is only one component of the operating system, which in turn comprises regular application software, such as a text editor or a compiler, software libraries used by many of these applications, such as the resolver library, used to turn hostnames into IP addresses, device drivers providing access to and control of certain hardware components, and the most central component of the OS itself, the kernel. Looking at software from this perspective quickly makes it clear that the term operating system itself requires some definition, as different OS providers include different components under this umbrella term. But before we attempt to tackle the question of what exactly defines an operating system, let us take a step back and attempt to better categorize software based on its proximity to the hardware or the end user. And what better way to do that than to compare software or the operating system to a car? People always like to compare other things to cars for some reason. I suspect this is because we all see cars all the time and thus believe that everybody understands how cars work. But alright, let's try and roll with this. When we boot up a system, we've seen that before our operating system is up and running, a bunch of things happen on a lower layer. So we clumsily represent this part here via this diagram of the ignition system. The analogous element in the world of computers might then be firmware. That is, the bits of software executing early on when we power on our system would fall into this category. But firmware is even more widespread. It covers, for example, the software running on your Wi-Fi access point. Now, this illustrates that it's quite difficult to properly categorize software. We know that a switch or router runs a full operating system, albeit a specialized one. And many of the consumer products do as well, frequently use customized versions of, for example, Linux. But since we often have no way of updating or managing the software, we consider it to be not quite so soft, and so we group this under firmware as well. Other devices that may be running some sort of firmware include things like remote controls, which nowadays can be of surprising complexity, or, say, your car's infotainment and navigation system. Again, these days your car is more likely to run a full-fledged operating system here, but as a user it remains largely opaque to us. Perhaps a bit lower level, but something we've also mentioned before, includes the electronics embedded in an IDE drive or really anything using USB. And as we also mentioned earlier, the fact that all these things are running some sort of software, firmware, means that they can be manipulated or compromised. Now, back to our server systems. The system BIOS certainly qualifies as a type of firmware, as it is embedded in the read-only memory but can be updated via special tools flashing the ROM, for example. Similarly, different persistent memory modules such as NVRAM, as shown here by example of an old Spark station, that then also function as a first stage bootloader. As we can see, there are ways to change the state of the system here in an interactive way. As a bootloader, it then eventually hands control off to the kernel. Now, back to our terrible car analogy, what would we say represents the kernel? Well, Perhaps we can think of the kernel as the motor. Without it, your car is pretty useless. But similarly, if all you have is a kernel, well, then you aren't going to get anywhere either. 
This, by the way, is why, as annoying as it may be, it actually is technically correct, the best kind of correct, to insist on saying the OS is called GNU Linux. But we don't have to be pedantic. Anyway, so our kernel is a piece of software. As you may know, there are different types of OS kernels, microkernels as well as monolithic kernels. The latter are the common kernels you'll find in the Unix systems we're looking at in this class. And so we've already seen a way to visualize what the kernel does. By looking at the boot messages, we see that it manages the hardware, manages memory and process scheduling, and provides the system calls for the regular user and libraries to interact with. But again, just like a motor all by itself, so is a kernel all by itself of limited use. What we need to build a more useful environment in which we can build our services is the core operating system. That is, all the bits and pieces that are not running in kernel space, but that are necessary for the system to become useful, usable. The operating system needs to be tightly integrated with the kernel. You can't just take a motor and plunk it into any chassis and think it'll work. You need compatible parts and connectors that fit. Likewise, the kernel is not independent from the rest of the system. And this is where things get a bit hairy. You all know that there exist many Unix versions, but those all remain their own coherent operating system. But with Linux, for example, we have many different variations of combining the Linux kernel with certain tools, many of which are the same or similar across distributions, to build an OS variation. Some distributions use the init startup system, others use systemd, for example. Some ship with version X of library Y, others with version X plus one. So you have core libraries that need to hook into the kernel and that really aren't completely independent of it. But on top of that, you also have a number of system components that specifically define how your operating system behaves and how users interact with it. You get additional functionality, but a lot of the functionality is quite involved in how to operate the system, how to interact with it, how to change settings. For us, perhaps the equivalent here is system software, core components of the OS, as well as the bits that influence their behavior, the configuration files and the like. Again, all of these are tied primarily to the operating of the system itself. And so most of the time, people have a need to extend the system, to add customizations, to buy some add-ons. In the software world, the equivalent to these sexy fuzzy wheel cover and pimped out seats, we might consider as add-ons, things like a web server, a database, an additional programming language interpreter with its libraries, a language platform and virtual machine, a calendar mail system editor IDE kitchen synchromatron, or a revision control system that nobody knows how it works. Now you're probably wondering, hey, wait a second, my OS comes with all of these out of the box. Those aren't add-on packages or customizations. But therein lies a dilemma and a larger discussion we'll go into in our next video. Deciding what software components are part of the OS, what is strictly speaking an add-on, what is core system software, and what is optional pink fuzzy frills. But besides the categories we've so far identified, firmware, kernel, operating system, system software, and add-on applications, we also increasingly have to deal with systems that fall in between. Since nowadays just about every device that you can plug into a power outlet comes with a full-fledged, insecure configured operating system running a web server that you can't turn off. And even though we may not always think about these devices and focus on server environments, it's useful to remember that the same principles do apply when managing embedded devices and non-compute resources brought into your network. What's more, all these separations of types of software fall further apart as we move into the area of virtualization, containers, and, say, unikernels. Is a static, immutable container an instance of an operating system, or is it more akin to firmware or a closed system application? Does the hypervisor in a virtualized environment count as a proper operating system? And where do individual applications running inside containers on the unikernel fall? Well, I'm afraid I don't have answers for you other than it depends and it gets messy real quick. But hey, welcome to the wonderful world of system administration. As I said, we'll try to bring in a little more clarity to some of this in the coming videos, when we talk about software bundling and installation and the separation of system software from the OS. But first, let's try to summarize what we covered today. 
First of all, and I hope this much should be very clear, software really is not at all like a car. Car analogies are almost always pretty awful. Next, and even though this sounds obvious, we sometimes forget. All of this software we're talking about is indeed software. That is, it's flexible, can be changed, can be configured, can be compromised. That is, many of the principles we'll apply when we talk about package management, software updates, or security principles in the coming videos all apply more or less equally to firmware as to the base OS as to add-on software. And so these are really the three broad groups we tend to divide software in. The low-level firmware, by which we often mean software that we generally do not change, that sits very close to the hardware, and that may be proprietary or require special tools to interface with. The core operating system, although we've already gotten a taste that it's not really a very clear-cut definition, no obvious line that separates add-on software from system software. But we do determine that there is some software that we consider to not be part of the operating system, and that we would need to add after OS installation, for example. But with these categories, we then immediately get to these questions. What really is the main difference? Is there one, perhaps, when it comes to how we manage the software? And what about all these other in-between things we mentioned, all the terrible internet of broken things? What about network gear, storage equipment, or special purpose hardware such as an HSM, or third-party appliances? Well, perhaps this video here has really only led us to more questions than answers, but it's probably a good idea for you to start thinking in these terms before we move on to software package management in our next video. So as a look back, as well as in preparation for that topic, you should perhaps go back to the different boot sequences you looked at from last week, and try to identify the different types of software you encountered and how they interact with one another. Then think about what the impact is of trying to update each one. Is that a straightforward thing? Can you make a change to one without the other? What things do you have to consider when you do that? Answers to some of these questions will be given in our next video. So until the next time, and thanks for watching. Cheers!